Good morning, everybody. I hope today you're enjoying your walk with God. I uh, hope you're loving life. Um, hopefully you're not putting too much pressure on yourselves. And that's common with men, with myself even. Uh, I put a lot of pressure on myself to try to be a godly person. And sometimes when you do that, you're your worst critic and uh, you don't enjoy your walk with God. And I think what we need to do is learn to enjoy our walk with God. So Anyway, I hope everybody's doing good. I hope you're enjoying the Bible studies. We're in uh, Mark uh, chapter 2, verse 23 through 28. We'll finish chapter 2 today. Uh, this will be study number 9. Um, so let's. Uh, this is one of the reasons I said I hope you're enjoying your relationship with God and your walk with God and the walk in faith is because that's kind of what this is about today. Uh, and let's take a peek at that. So in Mark chapter 2, verse 23, one Sabbath, Jesus was going through the grain fields and his disciples walked along. They began to pick some heads of grain. So it's on the Sabbath. Jesus is showing his authority again on the Sabbath in all things and above all things. And so we know that in the Ten Commandments, it says that the Sabbath day is supposed to be holy, that there should be no work done on the Sabbath day. And the priests had taken this to an extreme. They were counting steps, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So you couldn't do certain things. Like I think you could only take like 75 steps on a Sabbath. Basically, if you're going to uh, follow God, follow the Ten Commandments, use common sense. That's basically what it's all about. Use common sense. Give God priority. Love your neighbor. Use common sense when it comes to your walk with God. You don't have to be a legalistic nightmare or a Pharisee in the church, or for yourself. Use common sense. Give yourself some breathing room. Enjoy the day. Enjoy serving God. So on the Sabbath, Jesus was walking through the grain fields, and his disciples walked along. They picked some heads of grain. They were eating. They were hungry. So the common sense says, take a bite to eat. And they were probably grabbing the grain. And they were probably rubbing it in their hands. So the priests would see this, and they would say, that's work. That's too much work. Now, maybe if they took the grains off and just ate them, Maybe that wouldn't be so bad, but they were. They, it was common for them to take grain, rub it in their hands, clean it, or if it was like wheat or barley, I'm not sure which is which, but you rub the shells off and you would eat the grain itself. So they began to pick some heads of grain. The Pharisees, here come the law enforcers, here come the religious, please, let's learn this today in, in, in this study and going on for the church. Don't be legalistic law enforcers. God, preserve, uh, God prefers grace and mercy over judgment. The Bible's very clear on it. But here come the Pharisees. Look, what are your disciples doing? This is unlawful on the Sabbath. It actually wasn't, actually. It was, a, I believe it was a ceremonial type thing where uh, you couldn't do work on the Sabbath which was like extreme work well you know plowing a field or something like that would be the case but they took this to an extreme and i believe you know there's a book i think it's called the mishnah which we have jesus gave us two laws by the way. let me try to break it down so jesus gave us two laws and he says all the laws uh fall on these uh, and that would be i think it's matthew 22 37 that is to love the lord your god with all your heart soul mind and strength that's number one. And that's the first four commandments of the Ten Commandments, by the way. Those first four commandments apply to God himself. So the four, first four commandments belong to, are, uh, are pointing to God. They apply to God, your relationship with God, your worship with God. So Jesus says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And then the next six commandments of the ten apply to others. And Jesus says, love your neighbor as yourself. Those apply to the next six commandments. So he says then the whole law rests on these two commandments. So the first four commandments of the Ten Commandments apply to God. The next six commandments of the Ten Commandments apply to your neighbor, your friend, your fellow uh, mankind. And so Jesus says, love God and love your neighbor. And everything hangs on those two laws. But the Pharisees took this to extreme. They wrote this, they've got a thing called the Mishnah even, which has 6,800 laws which were written by rabbinical priests to help protect and keep people from violating the 10. Or if you want to go further, the 613 laws that actually exist. 
So they went a whole extreme further and they had taken this control and legalized. Basically, Jesus says, you have ruined the faith. You have become so legalistic. There's no breathing room for anybody to worship me. They're, they're more worried about violating laws than concentrating on their worship and gratefulness for knowing Christ or God as their Savior, as their Lord, as their King. And so they were worried about the, the priest law enforcement. So this is what's happening. So they said, look what, what they're doing. Look what your disciples are doing. This is unlawful, and that is not the case. Use common sense. They were taking a bite to eat. They were hungry. And then Jesus responds in verse 25. Have you ever read, and this is in 1 Samuel 21, by the way. I did look this up and read it. If you want to look up what Jesus is referring to, it's 1 Samuel 21, verses 1 through 16. This is what Jesus is going to refer to. Have you ever read what David did when he and his companions were hungry and in need? In the days of Abiathar the high priest, he entered the house of God and ate the consecrated bread. Now, the consecrated bread was, um, was a ceremonial law. That was, it was called like the bread of presence or the bread of thanksgiving, just to know that God was in their presence. God had come down to the, the temple and his presence was there, the tabernacle, his presence was there. And the bread was there for the priests to eat uh, as a thankful thankfulness or in thankfulness or in recognition of God's presence within the temple. And so basically in the days of Leviathan or the high priest, David, the King David, entered the house. And by the way, Abiathar, the, the priest trembled when he saw David. He said, oh my gosh, what are you doing here? The king is here. In the days of Abiathar the high priest, he entered the house of God and ate the consecrated bread, which was lawful only, lawful only for the priests to eat. But common sense said, David's coming in. He's got a few men that are very hungry. They're clean. They've not been violated. They're not living in an outward sin. So they can come into the temple and they can, in common sense, uh, eat the showbread or the bread that was there for the priests only, which is lawful for the priests to eat. And he gave some to the companions, and they ate. So there's a ceremonial law that says, um, basically, this, this bread is for the priests only, and they're to eat it in recognition of the presence of God, for example, or in celebration to the presence of God is for the priests. But then David walks in with his hungry men, and it, it's, it's also a law, however, a real law, to um, do good and to save a life. Which I, which I thought was very interesting. I was comparing those today, just looking at them a little bit. And so the ceremonial law, in commonly, and traditional law, commonly with the priests, would override even biblical law. And Jesus points that out after, actually in Matthew 15. So uh, he says, you preach the traditions of men above the word of God, because they love that control. And you see that today in politics today, in leadership today, people who are power hungry, um, you've heard the term, it's it's uh, not good for me, but good for thee, or whatever that is. I really am not in the politics that much, but but literally, this is, you know, we're going to enforce this. We're in charge, and we can do what we want, but you got to obey, and that's what's going on here. But Jesus is bringing them to the realization that, hey, let's use common sense here, guys. And in Luke 14, too, was another one I looked up. Jesus addressed a similar situation where he heals a man on the Sabbath, and the Pharisees are saying, hey, that's work. You can't do that, Jesus. Showing his authority, showing he's the Lord of the Sabbath, showing he, they have extended their reach beyond where it should be and becoming judgmental, he says, no, I'm going to heal this man. If, a man. if you lost your son and he fell on a well, wouldn't you pull him out of the well? As a matter of fact, if you had an animal and it fell in the well, wouldn't you pull the animal out of the well? How much more important are God's children? Let them eat. Leave them alone. Uh, and so use common sense. It is more lawful and more important to save a life than to let them starve to death. And, and I think of this, you know, with climate change and all these things, what good is protecting the planet? And I think we should protect the planet and be responsible. But what good is it if people are starving to death all over the world? That's horrible. We should find a way to do things maybe a little better for the greater good so that nobody's starving to death. And so Anyway, then he said the Sabbath was made for man. Now, remember this. The Sabbath was made for man. What, what does that mean? Well, we are to work six days. In America, we commonly work five days, and now there's legislation and there's lobbyists trying to push four days. In some places over in Europe, we'll work uh, four days. 
sometimes three days. Some of them take naps in the afternoon. What's the point of the Sabbath? Let's not get overzealous priests. This is what Jesus is referring to. Let's not get overzealous. Let's remember the Sabbath was created for man. And what was it for? To rest, to relax, to enjoy, to worship their creator God. That's what the Sabbath, it's not law enforcement day, guys. It's time to enjoy your relationship with Jesus Christ. And I would say that to the church today. One of the things that always kills me. Now, I'm not saying anybody's wrong or anything. It's just a personal thing. People say, when you go to church, you have, have to wear your Sunday best. Well, let me give you an example of what happened when that happened to me one day. One day I came into church. I was wearing a typical, I wear a West Side Barbell hoodie. And I get my, I buy, I buy jeans. I, I, who doesn't wear jeans? And I wore that to church one day. And one of the elders at our church, uh, he was wearing a tie. Again, nothing wrong with this. Nothing wrong wearing a tie to church. If you feel that's what you need to do, do it. I don't do it. I want to come to church comfortable after a hard week's of work and worship my God and just relax. But this man decided to approach me and say, you know, you're supposed to wear your Sunday best to church. And I looked at him and I said, well, what are you wearing? You got a tie, you got a button down shirt, and you've got uh, some slacks on. Very nice. You look very nice. Great. Good for you. Not for me. I'm not going to do that. You know? So he says, well, you need to wear your Sunday best. And I said, well, let me ask you a question. What's your Sunday best? He says, your nicest clothes, your most expensive clothes. I said, okay. How much was your tie? He says, $2. How much was your shirt? $2. I got it at the thrift store. How much were your pants? $6. So I said, in everything that you're wearing, you have on $10 worth of clothing. I'm wearing a hoodie and jeans. I got my jeans at Buckle, and I got my hoodie at uh, West Side Barbell. And my West Side Barbell, I think, was $45 alone. My, my jeans at Buckle, if you ever shop at Buckle, were 100 bucks. So he's wearing $10 worth of clothing, and I'm wearing a hoodie and jeans, which cost me over $150. So I asked him, so who's really wearing their Sunday best? And it's not about what you're wearing. It's about the heart attitude you have when you go to church. I'm not there to look at other people. I'm there to encourage people. I'm there to pray with people. I'm there to talk to them about their week. Some people just need somebody to hear them. They don't have nobody to talk to all week. And you can be that person. I ain't worried about what you wear. And guess what? Neither is Jesus Christ. Now, if you come in with booty shorts on and you have a plunging neckline and, you know, hey, let's let's be a little careful. I'm not to say, you know, let's let's hide the flesh a little bit. Let's be smart. Let's use common sense. But let's not get all crazy if somebody doesn't wear a suit to church. Maybe somebody can't afford a suit. And in today's day and age, suits aren't cheap. And, and a lot of people aren't working. You know what I said? We're just happy you're here. Please. Be modest. Be modest. Use common sense. Come to church. Enjoy yourself. Get to know God. And if you're one of those religious zealots, and if you're one of those people that's just overbearingly judging on other people, take a look at yourself. Kick back. Relax. And not say, say, hey, how can I help you today? I'm glad you're here. Can I pray with you today? You know, this is what the priests are doing, judging everybody. They're walking around enforcing the law that wasn't even meant to be forced. The Sabbath was created for man, and that is for us to rest, to enjoy life. And the reason, like, I even canceled Sunday night services at our church. Why? Because the family today has two working members. Dad and mom are both stressed out, working their butts off to make ends meet. They're going to soccer games. They're going to football games. They're going to dance recitals. They're going to gymnastics. Run, 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 run. You get Sunday off. The last thing I want to do on a Sunday is go to church twice. Now, if you go to church twice, good for you. Go, enjoy it, worship God twice. But you know what I say? Go to go in the morning, go to Sunday school, go to church, worship God, get to be with your church family, be a, be a committed member of your church and your church family. Donate time if you can. But at night, sit down together as a family. Watch a good movie. Remember, what I, I challenged my kids to memorize verses, and we had so much fun. Memorize Bible verses, and I would challenge them. Remember Psalm 100, Psalm 110, Psalm, uh, Psalm uh, 23. Remember Psalm 1. I love Psalm 1. Remember verses. Remember the Ten Commandments. Remember the Lord's Prayer. Have fun with that and give the kids rewards, but spend 
play a game, turn the TV off, put the phones in a bag, throw them in the yard, and sit down and have a, a play a board game. I know for kids these days, it might shock their system, but open up a board game, play Monopoly. I fall asleep playing Monopoly. I can never last the whole game. I'm too old. It takes forever, but it's fun. And you get to spend quality time together. You get to hear about the kid's day. You get to be vested in your kid's life, your wife's life, your husband's wife, life. Talk, talk, talk. And just get a pizza and tell stories. Get a puppy and run around with the puppy. I have no idea. Do what you got to do, but spend your time together on Sunday. The Sabbath was created for you to enjoy, to serve God, enjoy the family he's blessed you with, and get to know each other and love each other because the devil and the world is going to do all it can to keep you guys apart. And here's the same thing that's happened today. And Jesus then, you know, he gives his authority. Let's go. Mark chapter 2, verse 27. Then Jesus said to them, the Sabbath was made for man. After giving him the example about David, common sense, common sense. Then he said to them, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. So the son of man is Lord even of the Sabbath. Guys, listen to me. This is what he said. Listen, guys, take it easy. This is not, you know, uh, this is not law enforcement day. We, as a priest, you should be ushering people into the temple. How are you doing? How was your week? What can I do for you? And I could get into this even longer, but I won't do that because there's a lot of examples in the Bible, the widow's might and Jesus watching people give money into the offering and he leaves the temple. He's so disgusted the way it's being run. The church should be the same way. It should not be run in that way. It should be a place of just for, of rest, relaxation. I, I, I've heard it said a million times, a hospital for the hurting. Now, we gotta, you got to make ends meet in a church. You've got to do the best you can. You've got to run it responsibly. But we should be a hospital for the hurting, not a place to bring judgment on people and point the finger and put people under a microscope. Smash the microscopes. Smash the... The, the, the magnifying glasses smash the rules for certain traditional rules, by the way. Get rid of them. Let's be happy in church. Be happy in our walk with Jesus Christ. And so anyway, that's a short verse. This is, this is just a short thing. We finished chapter 2 today. The Sabbath was made for you. Enjoy it. Now, I, I, one thing I would make a thing is that the devil will use your Sabbath to distract you. He will get you involved in soccer, softball, flag football, YMCA things, school events to keep you from going to church. That's up to you. Now, I would say hopefully those things are after church. Don't let the devil steal you from your church and worship. Don't let him distract you because distraction, what the devil knows, is not a sin. Soccer is not a sin. Basketball is not a sin. But if it takes the place of God, it might be. We might want to really look at that. But it's not an overt, negative, crazy sin. And so he'll say, let's keep you so busy, you can't worship God. Keep you so busy, you can't even rest on Sunday so that Monday morning you're exhausted. You're like, what did I do this week? And I felt like I worked another job. Enjoy your Sabbath. Make it a priority to be with your family. Make it a priority to be with your Lord. And men, lead your family. Be the spiritual leader of your family. Show your family how much you love Jesus Christ. Model Jesus Christ. Find brothers to keep you accountable. Honor your wife. Hug your wife. Praise your wife. And women, praise your husband. Dads get beat up in the movies and on TV. Praise your husband. Honor your husband. And the kids will love it. And the one thing that I think my daughter paid me, the, uh, my wife and I, the biggest compliment ever was, Mom, Dad, I just hope I can find somebody like you guys did. Somebody that loves me as much as dad loves you. And dad, uh, I want to love my husband the way mom loves you. The greatest compliment I ever received in my life was from my baby girl when she said that I want to be a couple like you two. And we've been married 31 years and it's still fun. So anyway, love you guys. Have a great day. Enjoy worshiping your savior because he loves you and there's freedom in worship not um, not legal. You don't have to give up a bunch of stuff and follow a bunch of rules. Just get growing grace, growing Christ. Love him. You know, walk away from your sins. Just enjoy, enjoy your relationship with Jesus Christ. Life's hard enough than uh, being a law enforcer on Sunday morning. So have a great day. Again, thank you for all who subscribe. Please do subscribe if you don't. 
love to hit that mark where we could do this and, and give back to the community by by being monetized and so i'd appreciate any help and i thank you for everybody that tunes in and does subscribe already thank you for your support have a great day